and welcome to Veterans Remember. I'm Dick Gooding, your host of Veterans Remember, a series of conversations with Hopkins and veterans who have served our country during wartime and in peace. In our discussions, we hope to share with our viewers some of the experiences of our veterans who have served during World War II, Korean conflict, the wars in Vietnam, the Gulf and Iraq, and currently in Afghanistan. They share with us their personal stories and the impact their service has had on their own lives, as well as on the lives of all of us today. I'm joined today by Elisa Shambo, a Navy veteran who has served this country proudly for 12 years. Alicia, I'd like to welcome you to Veterans Remember and uh, hope that uh, you'll be able to enjoy this experience. Thank you, Dick. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about, uh, about yourself and uh, your youth and uh, how you get into the service at some point. That's well. Um, I was born and raised in Winchenden, Massachusetts, which is out Route 2, out by Gardner and Lemonster area. I'm the only girl um, out of five kids. I had four brothers, one of them being a twin. And um, my mom was a nurse. My dad had been in the Navy. And um, my twin brother decided to go off to college. We were the babies. And um, unfortunately, my father had died when I was 12. So. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. Was, he, was he real young? Uh, he was 58. 58. Yeah, yeah he, was, mm. he was considerably young. Very sudden, um, very unfortunate. Um, mm. But all my older brothers were gone and out of the house. It was just Alan and I and my mom. And uh, so it got time for us to think about college. And Alan wanted to go to college. And he had actually been accepted a year early. Um, so he left high school a year early, went on to college. And then it was my choice. Um, and I didn't want my mom to have to worry about swinging two tuitions. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know where I wanted to go to college or why I wanted to go to college, for that matter. And uh, when the recruiter came to school, um, I, I was hooked. I was ready to join the Navy. And um, it was an easy choice since my dad had been in the Navy. And my mom was a nurse, so that's why I went in as a corpsman. And you, you say your dad was in the Navy, and that had something to do with why the Navy was uh, was your choice. Mm -hmm. uh, can you explain? Tell well, us a little I was, bit about that. Well, that's what I was familiar with. Mm -hmm. um, I, I had no connection to anybody in the Army or the Air Force or the Marines. Um, Selfishly, I wanted to be stationed somewhere on a beach. <laughs> I didn't want to be in the middle of the desert, so um, that's why I that's why I chose the, chose the Navy, and uh, I was very happy. It was a wonderful decision, and not a day goes by that I would ever say I regretted it. And um, I would encourage you know young adults today to definitely consider a military career. They have a lot you, to offer. And did you go right after high school? Did you go off to boot camp? Or, yeah. uh... As a matter of fact, I actually missed graduation by six days. So oh, I, dear. while everybody was, else was partying, I was in boot camp. So I uh, had to take all my finals early, and and so I was unable to, you know, make that march for graduation day. My mother was very disappointed, but my class was getting ready to convene, and in order to make boot camp in time and then get out for my A school in time, I had to leave uh, May 31st. And where did you go to boot camp? Uh, Orlando, Florida. Mm -hmm. Yep. Hot, yeah. and it was that is June, July, and August, so it was pretty warm down there. And did you have a, a advanced knowledge of where you'd be uh, directed in the Navy, or did you just start off as a, a, a Navy grunt, whatever that is? Since uh, I'm an Army guy, you have yeah. to excuse me. No, no, no. When I um, signed up for the Navy, I made sure that I had a guaranteed a school uh, as a hospital corpsman. Because I, you know, I certainly didn't want to be swapping decks for the next four years. So, uh, as my mother being a nurse, like I said, that's why I chose the medic field. So I had a guarantee. I knew that when I got out of boot camp, I mm -hmm. was going to Great Lakes for core school. Yeah. I knew that after Great Lakes, I had no idea where I was going to end up. How was boot camp? Um, I'm pretty athletic, so it wasn't bad. You know, yeah. I got some good advice. Uh, keep your ears open, keep your eyes open, keep your mouth shut. And Were, uh, were there uh, a lot of other uh, women, or I guess at that point girls would yeah. be more appropriate, were there yeah. a lot of other girls in, in uh, your, your boot camp with you? Oh, yeah. 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 I, I was part of a company of 80. So, yeah. And I was just one company. There was mm -hmm. many. Yeah. 
Yep. And uh, after boot camp, where'd you head? After boot camp, um, I went out to Great Lakes, Illinois, to mm -hmm. core school. And I was there for a couple of months before getting my first duty station, mm -hmm. which was Oak Knoll Naval Hospital out in Oakland, California. Sure. And so. the, the, the specialized training that you had at Great Lakes, what, what does that entail? Is that sort of like almost like pre-med school or it's um it's like nursing school mm -hmm. so you have your um uh, drug therapy and your patient care and you mm -hmm. have your anatomy and physiology and um chemistry and orthopedics and surgical and labs and so it's just it's just like starting off nursing school yeah and when you went out to oakland did uh, you have any choice or was that just you you, you just found out where you were going when you finished up uh, your A school? Um, they always give you a, what they call a wish list. So I think I probably put down wonderful like locations like San Diego and, mm -hmm. you know, Rota, Spain and things like that. And But they said, no, Oakland, California. I said, okay. So off I went. You don't have a lot of choice. If there's a billet, um, they'll give it to you. But Well, there's a lot worse places to be there than, absolutely than is. Oakland, California. Right, right across place. the bridge from yeah. uh, San Francisco. And what did you do in, uh, in Oakland? When I first got to Oakland, there was three of us, three or four of us that arrived at the same time, and there was a few billets open, one of them being ICU and one of them being labor and delivery. And I was scared to death of ICU, so I took labor and delivery. <laughs> I was more familiar with babies than I was uh, ICU. I heard that, the, the, that there's an interesting corollary about how busy the uh, labor and delivery uh, unit gets yes. based on uh, events. Maybe you can yes. share a little bit with that. It was, uh, I remember my first baby boom, and um, you know, you'd have a couple babies being born throughout the day, throughout the weeks and all, but every once in a while, all of a sudden, you'd have 10 or 12 babies born in a two-day period. And the first time I questioned it, my charge nurse said, well, get out the calendar, go back nine months, and you'll see that that's when an aircraft carrier probably pulled in. <laughs> so you get, you know, an aircraft carrier with 5,000 guys plus all the escort ships. And, of course, these boys have been out to sea for months on end. And um, they came home and they made babies. <laughs> and, and we took care of them. Yeah. Yeah. And in, in, in Oakland, was was there a prosthetics unit? Uh, yes, uh, yes. Maybe you could tell us, a little, did, did you get involved at all with that? Uh, not so uh, much. I did rotate through the hospital mm -hmm. um, on request so that I could get more experience besides just labor and delivery and sure. nursery and all. So um, I did get to work in the operating room and the emergency room. But they were always developing um, different prosthetics, hands, fingers, arms, legs, knees, um, and that was right on the cusp of, of, you know, prosthetics when people were really starting to, you know, <clears throat> get injured on a board ship and get injured in wartime and coming mm. home and needing that kind of device. So it was very interesting to watch. Yeah. Yeah. After you left Oakland, you had an overseas assignment. I did. When I left Oakland, um, again, I put in my wish list for, again, road to Spain or <laughs> somewhere cozy. And uh, they came up with Subic Bay, Philippines. At, the point, at that time, I had no idea where Subic Bay, Philippines even was. But uh, <laughs> I came home and said goodbye to everybody back in Winchenden and packed my bags. And it was pretty comical. My four brothers drove me to the airport. Mm -hmm. And that was way back when you could walk your guest, you know, or your family member right to the gate. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget it. I was in uniform, and here I am, the baby and the only girl of the family, and they're walking me down to the gate, and all my brothers are six foot or, boy, or more. And to see four grown men standing there with tears in their eyes because their baby sister is going off to some foreign country, uh, yeah. it was pretty funny. It was comical. Well, going to the Philippines must have been uh, pretty exciting, uh, but also very challenging because you had a language barrier. Yeah. I, I don't oh, yeah. think that you were speaking fluent in Spanish at that it's point. It's actually ta it's called Tagalog, and uh, no, I was not. Yeah. And um, there's so many different barrios in the Philippines that there's a hundred different dialects. So there's some people in the Philippines that can't even communicate to other people because mm -hmm. the dialects are so different once you get out of the cities and into the barrios. But um, Now you were serving uh, uh, presumably uh, Navy and Navy families? Um, uh, in Subic Bay? It was everything, um, not just Navy. Um, as you know, that uh, the Navy 
is the medical staff for the Marines. Mm -hmm. So we saw quite a few Marines. Um, Angeles Air Force Base was right up the road, so they pretty much took care of the, the Air Force people. But mm -hmm. um, we were, we didn't see too many Army, but definitely Navy, active duty Navy, active um, duty Marines, and then all their dependents. So if you were married and you brought your wife to the Philippines and you had kids in the Philippines, then we took care of them as well. Mm. And uh, we also got called up on quite a few humanitarian calls. So our government had an arrangement with the Filipino government, and um, quite often we would go out in town. I worked on the emergency room uh, ambulance, and uh, we would be called out in town for, you know, uh, bad accidents that they couldn't treat on their own or, um, you know, births or things like that. Anything that ever involved a military member, we were always called. Did you live uh, on base uh, while you were in the uh, Civic Bay? Temporarily. Yeah. Temporarily, I lived in the barracks. Um, but while I was there, it's such a beautiful country that mm -hmm. I just felt like if I was going to be there, I wanted to experience it. So I got an apartment out in town, and I bought a car off um, one of the captains that was leaving, a little Toyota. And uh, it was wonderful. It was, it was nice to immerse yourself amongst the... Um, the country, the mm -hmm. people, the food, the noises, just their way of life. Uh, they're wonderful people, and it's a beautiful, beautiful country. Have you ever gotten back to the Philippines? I can't wait. I yeah. want to go back. I definitely want to go back. But without the base being there, I'm mm -hmm. not sure. Um, well, the base is gone. Oh yeah, the base is gone. Well. Yeah, the military, the navy is pulled out. Um, yeah. I'm sure the base is being utilized, and I'm sure that you know the United States Navy is still there to some degree but the base in itself isn't what it was when I was there hmm. yeah and you did learn uh, learn the dialect uh... I could say a few words but not many <laughs> <laughs> come over here halicadito I can yeah. you know, things like that you know yeah. you learn to communicate though and and they're pretty good at learning English mm -hmm. and how long were you over there in the Philippines two years two years yep Yep. And then uh, was that the end of uh, your active duty service, or yep, uh, it was. Yes, that was. Then it was stay in or get out, and mm -hmm. I wanted to go to college, so I stayed. I got out of active duty and immediately signed up for the reserves mm -hmm. and stayed in the Navy reserves while going on to college in Charleston, South Carolina. And what brought you to Charleston, South Carolina? Friends. Friends. Yep, and yeah. I knew there was a Navy base, and it was warm. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, so and I loved it. I had come through there on my way home because I was discharged out of Treasure Island in San Francisco, and mm -hmm. then drove cross country, and uh, stopped in there and visited, and just fell in love with the campus, fell in love with the town, the city, and so went back. I remember uh, uh, Charleston when uh, I think it was Hurricane Hugo. Went uh, I through. was there. Were you? Yeah, I did. Knocked yeah. down all those that gorgeous was a mess. old trees yep, in yep, uh, downtown yep, Charleston. Yep. Huh. Yep. Yeah. And, and what did you study at the College of Charleston? International business. International yeah. business. Now, what? Uh, that's not quite the same as the medical field that you had been no. uh, training no. and working in. No. What? Uh, what brought you into international business? Well, you know, Dick, in, in the medical field, um, most positions are not Monday through Friday, mm -hmm. nine to five. So it's weekends and it's holidays and it's the middle of the night and it's always changing. And, um, you know, as a little girl, having a mo mother who was a nurse, you know, I know what it was like to get up on Christmas and have mom mm -hmm. not be there or come home from school on your birthday and have mom not be there because, you know, she was working. It's sure. just the shifts that they have. Um, and I wanted something more you know, my, like I say, Monday through Friday, 9 to 5, something that I could take normal holidays off and have a schedule. Mm. Yeah. But you maintained your active uh, reserve status, yes. is that correct? Yep, I stayed and, in reserve. And was that right in Charleston, mm -hmm. or did you go other places other than Charleston? Um, most of the time on a regular drill weekend, mm -hmm. it was right in Charleston. And I also volunteered on the USS um, Yorktown, which is... Um, an, air, an old aircraft carrier down there that's docked in the um, bay of Charleston, and that's where the Sea Cadets drill. So I was the corpsman for the Sea Cadets, which I'm not sure if you're familiar with them. It's um, no. Why don't you tell us about the Sea Cadets? It's it's, it's a great um, it's a great group. In fact, we have one right here in Boston that my son Thomas was involved with for a while. Mm. But it's like boot camp. Uh, it's like the Navy for teenagers, boys and girls. They go in. They have to do their there are basic military requirements. They have to run their PT tests. They wear a complete uniform. They make rank. Um, 
they follow the chain of command and uniform code of military justice and the whole nine yards. And it's to try and, um, you know, introduce them to the Navy without a commitment. Sure. So they can go in and they can get out as they choose. But if they do stay in and then they want to apply to some place like, you know, the Naval Academy or mm -hmm. um, any branch, any academy, um, it just helps. It While helps. you were at Charleston or at the, at the, you know, the College of Charleston, mm -hmm. Uh, were you going there on the GI Bill, in essence? Uh, it wasn't called the GI Bill. It was called um, VEEP, Veterans Administration, Educational Administration Program. But So essentially, yes, Uncle mm -hmm. Sam paid for my college degree. I think uh, you know, it's important for, for us to share that with people. Yes. I know I went to grad school on the GI Bill back in yep. <clears throat> the 70s, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's certainly an opportunity and, uh, you know, sometimes people aren't aware of the opportunities by uh, right. serving their country and maybe deferring going off to college, waiting until you get a little yep. more mature. Right. I, also, yep. uh, the financial impact of it uh, can get mitigated by that. Sure. Too. Yep. So how long did you stay in Charleston? Just through your... Uh, Just through my college. Yeah. Yep. I, so I got there, I think I was there 84 through 80... I think I stayed a little bit after 88, so I came home, I think, in 89. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And when you came home, uh, did you stay in the reserves? I did. You did? I stayed in the reserves. I was stationed at the Naval Station in Quincy, the Reserve mm -hmm. Navy Station in Quincy. And from there, um, you know, I one time I volunteered to go on the USS L.Y. Spear, which is a subtender that was on its way to Norway. And um, they were looking for corpsmen, so I volunteered and spent a month on the... USS L.Y. Spear, which was interesting. Really? And, went yep. to Norway? Went to Norway. Went from, uh, flew from here to Norfolk, Norfolk to Halifax, Halifax to Norway, and then flew home. Beautiful. Not exactly Rhoda, but No, uh, no, but, but it was beautiful. Nice. It was yeah. beautiful. Yeah. 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 And, and, and now you started your, uh, essentially your work career, your business career outside of the military. Mm -hmm. And what did you do there? Well, when I first came home and I was in the reserve still, I was working for Banyan Systems. Um, which is no longer around, but mm -hmm. I was uh, worldwide logistics, and then from there I moved into marketing and corporate events. Mm -hmm. And then um, when my third child was coming along, that's when I decided it was time to get out of the corporate field and try and do something out of the house and be a mom. Yeah. So at that point, that's when I started an interior design business, uh, primarily focusing on custom window treatments. But at the, t at the time, you were still uh, involved with the reserves. And, I was. Uh, I was involved in the reserves, and I was going to school. So I was working full-time at Banyan mm -hmm. and in the reserves, and it was Desert Storm. And my unit had been pulled out to 29 Palms for special training. 29 Palms. Yes. That, where is that? That's uh, east of Los Angeles. <laughs> Near it's, the Joshua Tree. It's exactly out oh. in the desert. Yeah. Yes, yes. So we were out there for I a couple of weeks. I think that's the largest marine military base I in the United so. States. Yep. I, I guess in geography. I'm yeah. Not, I'm not sure about. And I know we were stuck out in the do, middle of it. What did you do out there? <laughs> well, we had to learn how to put up, um, you know, desert hospitals. Mm -hmm from mm -hmm. scratch. So we had to erect the tents and set up the operating rooms and the ERs and staff them and run the chow hall. And so it was just teaching us that, you know, if we did get mobilized and we had to go overseas, you know, what exactly we needed to do and be prepared for. There was combat training and there was hostage situations and, um, you know. And did you go to 29 Palms as part of the unit, or did you go individually? Uh, the whole unit went. The whole unit the whole went. whole unit went. Mm -hmm. hmm. yep. And then what what came of that? Did, did well, they get uh, active or mobilized? Some of them, did, some of the unit did. I mm -hmm. did. I got a call, and I had uh, you know 24 hours to wrap up my gear and report to the U.S. Naval Hospital in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And the purpose of that was to backfill staff who had gone over to the Gulf. I see. So. And, and at this point, you had three children. No, no. no. This, is at this, before, this is before. This is before the this children. Is, oh, this is before the children, yeah. and um, this is before marriage even. Mm -hmm. um, but I, you know, I was in a relationship, and uh, so it was shortly after the war ended, and they shipped me back home um, that I had to make the decision to stay in or get out, and uh, that's when I made the decision to get out. And you served uh, how, how long on active duty? Four years active duty. And how about the reserves? Eight years reserves. So that's a 12-year commitment. Mm -hmm. Boy, that's a, that's a, a long time to be uh, 
to be in the service. Yes, it is. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed every minute of it. I loved mm -hmm. it. I would definitely encourage kids today to think about it. Um, you know, unfortunately, I think people have the wrong impression of the military. Um, you know, quite often if I go into the schools on Veterans Day to talk to the kids, if you ask the question, what is the military? member do? You know, what does somebody in the Navy do? Oh, they, they shoot guns and they blow things up. And <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, you know, it's, it's too bad that that's what they have as an image because I try and teach them that, you know, the the Navy is in every branch has doctors and lawyers and um, accountants and cooks and barbers and I mean there's nothing that you can't do outside the military that you can't do inside the military. Mm -hmm. So, uh, well, even though you left the reserves, uh, I know that you have maintained a uh, a lot of active interest and involvement in service-related things, uh, to including to I think you're working with a group out of Milford. The, I am. Uh, maybe yeah. you could explain a little bit about that, Alicia. Um, <clears throat> I was uh, doing a job one day, and I, I ran into this young woman, and she said she worked for the ESGR, which stands for the Employer Support of the Guard and Reserves. And it's an agency that reports to the De Department of Defense, and our chairman is uh, located down at the Pentagon. And our role is to educate employers and employees who happen to be guards members or reserve members, so that's the Air National Guard or the Army National Guard or any of the reserve branches, um, what their rights and responsibilities are as an employer or an employee, so that like myself, when I got activated um, from reserve status onto active duty status and I had to leave my full-time corporate position, um, everybody was didn't know quite what to do. Um, mm -hmm. Would I have a job when I came home? Uh, did they have to hold me a job? Did they have to keep my medical benefits in, in place? Did they have to make up any difference in pay? When I did come home, was I allowed a certain amount of vacation time before reporting back to do, before reporting back to work? Things like that. So that's what the ESGR does, is we, we ed educate and mitigate any issues that arise between an employer and an employee who has been activated. Well, and certainly with the uh the use of the uh, the National Guard and the Reserves over the past you know ten years or so mm -hmm. uh, as a, an active fighting force becomes much much more an sure. issue than uh, those of us who were just strictly on active duty and didn't have uh, other employers to exactly. worry about. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Uh, I think the public right now doesn't realize that almost fifty percent of our active fighting force is made up of reserve members and guard members. I advised the Mass National Guard back in the uh, early 70s, and they were no more, although they most of them knew what they were doing, but uh, there was nothing like the units that I see now yeah. and, and how, uh, well, they're fully battle prepared. And, yes. Uh, you yeah. know, it's certainly, certainly a testament to the, uh, uh, to the strength of the service. The, yeah, the, the military is doing an amazing job mm. at, to make sure that the reserve units are, in fact, trained and ready to go. And they're doing a great job mm. at supporting their families while they're gone and standing behind them when they come home. Um, and, and the different programs that are available to um, you know, military members, it's just, it's incredible right now. There's yeah. a hire a hero um, where military um, guards members and reservists can post their resume. Mm -hmm. And so as an employer, you can log on to hire a hero if you specifically would like um, a military person to come to work for you. Sure. So, yeah. Well, Alicia, I think it's exciting that uh, not only did you have a a pretty good career in the military, but you continue that. And uh, I think the service that you're providing in that role uh, is probably equally as important to when you are on active duty. Well. And uh, certainly the uh, uh, the support of the Guard and their families and, and employers who get mystified by uh, some of the rules and right. really right. don't understand it. Right. And I think that's exciting. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I really, really welcome uh, your stories uh, for us this morning well, and I uh, really do appreciate you coming in. It was my pleasure. And I'd like to thank you all for joining us in this episode of Veterans Remember. And I also want to thank Alicia Shambo, 
Veterans Remember is a series of conversation with Hopkins veterans who have served their country during wartime and peace. They have personally helped to preserve our freedom and have made numerous contributions to the town of Hopkinton. I'm Dick Gooding, your host, and I thank you for joining us today on Veterans Remember. I want to be a pediatrician. Uh, I was hoping to become a chef someday. As long as there's somebody behind you pushing you and supporting you, then you feel that you always have the strength to keep going. So get involved and do your part. Invest in the future. Mentor a child. HCAM TV showing movies? That's right. Dive in Drive is a new show on HCAM. Join Mike and I as we present some B movies. Movies that have piqued the two Mike's interest. And not to mention, they're also free. We'll give you some interesting tidbits about the cast and crews. And point out some of the reasons these are classic B films. So check out the HCAM TV website at HCAM.TV for movie names and showtimes. Hi, I'm Cheryl Peralt, host of the program Meet Your Neighbor on HCAM TV. This show introduces you to Hopkinton residents, the many interesting people who are our neighbors, and we invite them to share stories, experiences, insights, and observations from their lives. We'd like to hear who you think should be interviewed on our program. So if you know someone that Hopkinton should get to know more about, please email me and stay tuned for more episodes of Meet Your Neighbor on HCAM TV. You're on public property. By law, minors aren't allowed to smoke in public. You're going to notify your parents. This is an education material to uh, inform you of being on 